So, let's see. So we have talked about extrapolation, which is a uh, topic we're going to come back to again because we're going to be using the words extrapolation, the ideas of extrapolation when we discuss the residuals. Now, um, there was perhaps one last topic in Chapter 3. Aha, standardized regression coefficients. All right, well, this is another idea, okay, section. There's not a whole lot of computation, but there's another idea at the end of Chapter 3 involving standardized regression coefficients. Um, let me spend a few minutes on that, otherwise I'll have to come back and do it anyway. So what we're, gonna, what we're doing is we're making a transition now into discussing model adequacy and performance of the model. And the key thing will be to have to be studying residuals both numerically and visually, but also there are some other um, numerical measures that we want to introduce. And one of them is variance inflation factors. And that's what we're getting to here. But I need to introduce, I want to introduce standardized regression coefficients first, and then the vari variance inflation factors. So how could we um, compute dimensionless regression coefficients? Well, how does it go? I mean, if you had y equals beta 0 plus beta 1x plus error in a simple linear regression, what would be the um, units of beta? What? Uh, units of y divided by units of x. Minus of u divided by units of x. Okay. Simple enough. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce units of y divided by units of... Uh, I'm going to introduce... Uh, um, I'm going to kill the units of y and kill the units of x in defining a dimensionless thing. So I'm going to define bj uh, hat equals to beta j hat times the square root of sjj over sst. This is... Um, where SJJ is, has units of X, which is summation XIJ squared minus NXJ bar squared. In other words, the corresponding SXX that we had before only used the Jth regressor, XJ. I goes from 1 to N. Okay. So J is fixed in this calculation, just referring to the Jth regressor, I, is going from 1 to n, the data. So this is the jth regressor, vari variability of jth regressor. And so that has, so if I take a square root of that, that has units of, uh, the units of xj, right? And then SST is simply what we, we know what that was. That's summation yi squared minus ny bar squared. That's the variability of y as a whole. Okay. I goes from 1 to n. We also had a notation for it that was syy. Okay. The variability of y. All right. So that's I can define that. I can always define that. And then it turns out, and then if I then... Um, then if I also define um, y i zero to be y i minus y bar, I'm going to center and do a unit length scaling of all of the variables involved, y and x one and x two and everything like that. 
So this is called a unit length scaling, SST here. In other words, I take yi minus y bar and divide by its vari the square root of its variability. So that's a new, it's just a centered y. I'm just changing the location of the vector and centering it and scaling it, okay, to having no units, dimensionless scaling. So now the, the uh, yi0 will have no units and they'll average to zero. I'm doing a very, I'm just linear scaling all the variables, okay? And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to put Wij equals Xij minus Xj bar divided by the square root of Sjj. I'm going to do exactly the same thing for all the regressive variables. Making it dimensionless and having them average to zero. So now, if in the new variables, what's the point of averages? Absolutely nothing. The origin, right. W1 bar, W2 bar, W3 bar, WK bar, and, and the Y0 bar is just the point 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and 0, okay? The regression plane that we had always goes through the point of averages. Now that, that regression plane has been shifted to the origin, okay, of XY space, right? which is x1, x2, y space, okay, in our case. All right? So I'm actually looking at the scatter, thinking about the scatter plot and, and the plane approximating that cloud of scatter points at this point. The real physical uh, linear regression model. Okay? So I put all those in, and then uh, what do I have? Then I have yi0 equals b1 Wi1, there's no intercept anymore because I don't need one. Because if I if I if, if the plane is pass, if this uh, plane passes to the origin, then there's not going to be any intercept needed. Plus b k w i k plus error. Okay, then the uh, is the uh, corresponding uh, dimensionless regression model. A dimensionless regression model corresponding to the original model, to our original linear model with an intercept. All right. And um, it turns out that B, J, uh, and then the estimates of the BJs are simply as given to the left. Estimates BJ hat, the linear regression, the least squares estimates are just as given over there. You may see that because, I mean, you can see that easily enough just by multiplying all the, the stuff back again. What you're going to get is simply that BJ is equal to beta j times uh, the flip of this square root sign, okay? So not only is the hat equal, but the actual parameters are equal, okay, in the model. All right? You can think of the hat, uh, you can think of letting uh, n go to infinity anyway. Bj hat goes to Bj, beta j hat goes to beta j. So then you actually get Bj equal to beta j in the model. Ah, beta j times this, well, actually, well, SST would go to, uh, Oh, I guess you've got to be a little bit careful with that. This going to infinity. <laughs> okay. Um, times the limit of this. Okay. So, okay. By changing the origin and the scale of the axes, I get, okay the cloud points can be approximated by this plane. To mention, of course, the original model, least squares estimates beta j hat equals, as before, beta j hat times the square root of sjj over stt. Okay. 
All right, so then what, is, what does the model become? It becomes y0 equals, I'm going to call it w now, where this is a k by k, uh, k, n by k matrix, not by n by p, but n by k matrix times, um, times b1 through bk plus error, plus error, epsilon. Okay, I can call it epsilon zero if you want to maintain the notation. Okay. This is the model. And now what is, uh, so I get to mention this regression coefficient this way. What is the W prime W? w so the B hat is equal to W prime W inverse W prime Y. Because it's exactly the same form, uh, Y zero here is exactly the same formulas that we had before with W in place of X and Y zero in place of Y. So what is, what is all this business? Well, it turns out that the way we've defined things, that W prime W is exactly a matrix of correlations between the regressors. And W prime Y is just the correlations between the regressors and Y. Let's just check that out. Let's do W prime Y first. W prime Y is what? It looks like there's no column of ones, or a row of ones now in W prime. So it's going to be it's going to be W one one W two one W N one then W one two W two two so on W N two the second the second so I'm, I'm just getting this is going to be uh, this is W prime is uh, the K by N all right and then finally W one K down to WNK, and then you've got Y01 down to Y0N. Okay, what do you get when you actually plug these numbers in? Okay, the W's are centered X's. Okay, so this just comes out to be X11 minus X1 bar. This first row, let's just focus on this first row, and then into the Y's. Y1 minus my Y1 minus Y bar divided by the square root of S Y Y. Okay, and then down to Y N minus Y bar divided by the square root of S Y Y. Then you have here X1 1 down to X N1 minus X1 bar. Then I'm dividing by the square root of S X X. I'll just call it the square root of S X X because that's the one we're familiar with, right? Okay, so let's look at this inner product. What does that give you in the first entry of this product matrix? XIY minus X bar Y bar. That's right. Divided by the square root of SXX, SYY. Okay, so this one, one entry becomes, this one, one entry, the first, there's going to be, uh, K entries here, right? This is going to be a K by 1 matrix. Right? This is an N by 1. This is going to be a K by 1 matrix, and the first entry is going to be summation X I 1 minus X 1 bar, Y I minus Y bar, divided by the square root of S X X, I'll call it, well, S X 1 X 1, square root of S Y Y. Okay? What is that? Anybody know what that is? Okay, that's called a sample correlation, okay? <laughs> Usually you see a divide by n minus 1 on the top and, a divide and, and then over n minus 1 down here. This is a sample variance. If I put an n minus 1 in here, those are sample variances, and I can put an n minus 1 up here because there's two square roots in the bottom that equals dimension uh, 1, right? So a uh, divide by n minus 1 on the top, that's a sample covariance. Divided by n minus 1 under the sx axis, and that's yy, and that becomes sample variances. So this is also known as little s x1y over little s1 uh, times little s y. Okay? s1y. Well, that's the. I'll call it, instead of S1, I'll call it X1Y and SX1. That's where SX1 is the sample standard deviation 
Can you read that? SX1. So SX would be the square root of summation XI minus X bar squared over N minus 1. I goes from 1 to N there. That's a sample standard deviation. Okay. SX1 SXY would be a summation XI minus X bar, YI minus Y bar over N minus 1. That's called a sample covariance. This is called a sample standard deviation. So what you get after you divide by these n minus 1s to bring in the sample covariance and the sample standard deviation is not actually necessary because it's just an identity. But to remind you those things, this is a sample correlation equals r 1 y. It's the correlation between sample correlation between x1 and y. And you can find those in Excel by using the correlation button, right? And that doesn't matter whether, okay, how would, you, how would you do it? Okay, so if I go back up to this data that we had, the soft drink data, um, let's just go ahead and calculate correlations. <laughs> what are some sample correlations? Let's see, I've got two regressors there, so I'm talking about two sample correlations in the soft drink data. Or most of these cases, there's two regressors. So the k by k matrix, or k by n matrix, is 2 by n. But, and so this uh, k by 1 that I'm getting out here is just 2 by 1. There's two sample correlations. So let's see. Let's draw the picture. How do you find the correlations between x1 and y and x2 and y? You just go to tools. I don't know if you use this for your homework or not. Data analysis, correlation. Most people didn't, I believe. Okay, input range. Um, guess what? I'm going to cancel that because I need to get the, uh, the, the y's together. Okay? I'm going to take out this column of ones. Where am I? Uh, mm, no, I can't. <laughs> so let's um, copy all these together down again. Let's just copy them all over. I'm not going to be maybe perfect here, but I'll get it done, okay? What is this junk? Okay, with the clipboard. Okay. I want to highlight all this business. I'm going to get all the correlations. Data analysis, correlation, okay. Put it in. I guess they don't highlight it till now. Group by columns. No labels in this case. Output range. Let's put it here. Actually, it would be better to put all the columns, wouldn't it? So you know what things are. So let's change this. Let's do this. Okay, there we go. Group by columns. Uh, labels. Okay, now I can do the output range. Let's just put it here. Okay. Those are the correlations. The correlation between a variable and itself is automatically 1. The correlation is between minus 1 and 1. Okay. <clears throat> and this is a symmetric matrix, so the correlation between, so this is the correlations. You will find a correlation coefficient R in your homework aid to deal with a confidence interval for a correlation row. All right. So what we're seeing is that the correlation between X1 and Y is 0.9646 in this data set. Wow. And the correlation between X2 and Y is 0.89167 here. 
x2 and y. And x1 and x2 point 8, 2. Okay? And if I just want the correlation between x1 and x2, of course, it's just a smaller matrix. <laughs> okay? So, it's the two entries I would get in this column that I just was writing down, W prime Y are this number and this number. Okay? So, capital W prime Y super zero, I guess we called it, and this is what we're doing here. That was equal to uh, this number. Well, equals this number and equals this number. Ah, put it in the wrong place. Equals this number. <laughs> okay. Okay. So that's a two by one matrix that I was writing down on the board. Everybody clear with what it is? This R1Y and R2Y is a notation in the book. So this is R1Y because the first regressor, correlation between the first regressor and Y, and this one was R sub 2Y, the correlation between the second regressor and Y. Correlation 1 means is it exactly a, uh, a linear relationship between the two columns. Right? One column is a linear transformation of the other at R equals to 1. Okay, we expect high correlations because of the linear relationship, right? Yeah, but we don't necessarily expect high correlations between x1 and x2. Okay, that's the point eight two four two one five, right? What's that all about? Isn't that a bad thing? It can be bad, and that's where we're going. Okay, now. What is the W prime W matrix? The W prime W matrix is simply all the correlations. So W prime W. Gosh, I could I could see how it would just work if I just did it all on the computer. Okay. <laughs> okay. Can I do Can I do a whole array at one swap? Yeah. Equals. Uh, we'll do that not one because I have to designate the array. Yes, I thought. Click the upper left. How can I do that? I have to click up here? Yeah. What do I have to do? Equals? That's okay then. I can put in this. Okay. Didn't do it. Oh. Little devil. Screw it. Okay. No, I guess I'm okay now. <laughs> so. Now I'll try equals. I need a control shift. And then I want to. And I put the wrong number here. It's not going to let me change that number, is it? No. <laughs> so I really need to put this number in here first. A two four two one five. Okay, then I put it in. How do you know? Okay, so it at least did that much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, that's the W prime W matrix. This one down the diagonal. And it's correlation. There's only one correlation between x1 and x2. There's not one. That's the, correla the correlation between x1. The correlation between x1 and itself is one. The correlation between x2 and itself is one. So there's an exact linear relationship between x2 and itself. There's an exact linear relationship with, between x1 and itself, obviously. All right? x1 equals x1, <laughs> okay? But x2 is not equal to a plus bx1, right? Point wise. But, it, you know, this, this correlation indicates how close it is to a linear relationship in some sense. Okay? No, depend, no linear dependence at all is correlation zero. Now, um, okay, so I'm going to turn this back off again, take the picture off, excuse me, while we make that change. So in the book now, they've also got another picture which I can, I don't need to refer to the camera because it's so easy to write. But if, they, if you have an orthogonal design, then of course all the correlations are going to be zero. So what we have here is that, is that, um, 
is that W prime W is equal to R I J is the matrix where R I J equals the correlation. This is a K by K between X I and X. Well, I should put X. I put R J L. I need two indices, X J and X L. Okay. Because remember, uh, one less or equal to J and L less or equal to K. I is my data index, J is my regressor index, L is my other regressor index. Okay? Where this was one on the diagonal. Okay? Because correlation between a variable and itself is R11 equals R12, R11 equals R22 equals R33, and so on equals 1. All right, so there's a little extra correlation, <laughs> a pretty small one. Okay? Uh, and then W prime Y was, Y0 was equal to uh, R1Y, R2Y, and so on down to RKY. All right, the correlations between the various regressors and the Y variables, which tend to be large, okay, in terms of close to 1. Okay, if the regressor is important, if the regressor is not important, then the, you'd expect the correlation not to be so big, okay? And of course, if there are many regressors, they may not all be big correlations. But here, x1 and x2 were themselves highly correlated. So if x1 was going to be highly correlated with y, then x2 would also have a pretty high correlation with y. Okay. But whether it was important in the model or not is another question. So we do have some correlation between the regressors. Now, an orthogonal design is, is one like this. We have x1 and x2 basically uh, in kind of rectangular grid form with balanced number of observations at each corner. All right? So if I had, for example, x1 is equal to 1, 1, uh, 2, 2, 2, Let's see, and I had x2 was equal to, so this is 1 and 2, and let's see, if I had x2 is equal to 1 and 2 also, let's see, how would I have to do it? Maybe I have to make it balanced, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2. This is obvious, okay, then I could have x, uh, let's see, uh, only 4. Okay, I could have like this, and x2 is equal to 1, 1, 2, 2, 1, 1, 2, 2. Okay, that would be a balanced design. Okay, and that would be orthogonal regressors. The correlation here is zero. R12 equals to zero. Okay, so to have two observations at each of the four corners is what I have. So I'm putting x1 equal to 1, x2 equal to 1, that's down here, uh, and I do it again. x1 equal to 1, x2 equal to 1, and so on. And then I, I have two observations at each of these corners. And so that's just the x space, right? That's just regressor space. That's the design. That would be an orthogonal design. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to calculate W prime W inverse. <laughs> which in this case, the, for the delivery time data, was equal to 1, 1. What were the numbers on the off diagonal? I just had on the screen 0.8242. That was the business, 0.8242. I need to calculate this inverse because that's the, the C matrix, or the, the thing that allows me to calculate the variance of the, of the dimensionless Uh, regression coefficients. Covariance b hat is equal to um, sigma squared times w prime w inverse. Okay.
So what does this come out to be? This comes out like this, and what? How do you calculate the inverse? Well, it's one over one minus uh, point eight two four two squared, and then you're going to get a one one then a minus point eight two four two, and a minus point eight two four two. So what you get in general is so then uh, so what's the so therefore what's the variance? of b zero hat, that's going to be equal to, I'm sorry, b one hat. There's two regressors, no intercept. Variance of b one hat is therefore going to be um, one over one minus this point eight two four two squared times sigma squared, and then the variance of b two hat. The sigma squared is not the same sigma squared. I'm just writing sigma squared. All right. It's not the same sigma squared before we, you know, scaled. But that doesn't matter. I could call it sigma sub zero squared or something like that if you want. All right? Okay. If it were an orthogonal design, the variances would just be sigma squared. So this is 1 over 1 minus r12 squared sigma squared. And this comes out to be 1 over 1 minus r12 squared sigma squared. This is the case of just two regressors, regressors only. There's a general formula then, OK, for what that is. Okay, and these come out to be uh, the numbers. The numbers there are about three, right? If I actually calculate those, these are the variance inflation factors: 3.118. Okay, this is called the variance inflation factor, VIF. One equals VIF. Two equals 3.118. Okay, what's the variance inflation factor? It's it's telling you that relative to an orthogonal design, how much the variances of the regression coefficients would have been inflated by. All right? In other words, there's that much more variability in the coefficients themselves than I would have had if I would have had an orthogonal design. So what the author is arguing is that the uh, the coefficients themselves have an instability relative to the orthogonal case, and he he gives an example of how to imagine that in the book where he actually shows regressor space again in an unbalanced design, okay, and showing how. Uh, you would expect more of an instability in the actual coefficients themselves. Okay, so this is a little bit hard to explain because it's if, you know, relative to the, or, you know, the orthogonal case, these are the inflation factors. Okay. So it means that... If you resample, you're going to get... You, if you resample for the same x values, you're going to get a certain variability in the b's, right? It goes back to the betas, too. Okay. So th that the amount of variability there is greater than it would have been if, than if you had an orthogonal design. Now, what about? Uh, so we don't. Does that help? And that reduces our ability to know the significance of particular factors. Well, it doesn't. It does. Strangely enough, it does not affect estimation of the mean response. Okay. In other words, the estimation of the mean response, it, it goes, you know, <laughs> but, um, but for, an, for an, you know, at a particular set of points in the data set. In other words, you can take regressor values x11, x12 to take the first 
uh, values of the regressors. Like here, in this example, I think it was 500, it was seven cases of 560 feet. If I actually take a point in the data set and estimate the mean response, um, it doesn't matter, okay? It doesn't, it doesn't, there's an orthogonal design or not orthogonal design, it won't really make any difference here, okay, for estimating mean response. But if I want to extrapolate, okay, and get new points, then the variability in the betas is going to make a difference, okay? So the model is, has, you know, you get trouble if you want to extrapolate or even, in, you know, if, if you can go to an interpolation zone with it's kind of empty spots, okay? The performance of the model. If you sample once and you estimate and then you sample again and you estimate, you might get wildly different answers. Okay. For what you expect the mean response to be. You say, well, I have no idea what the mean response is now because of all this variance inflation. Okay? At an extrapolation point or kind of a you know, a, a kind of a a gray zone interpolation point. Okay, so that's the that's the consequence of the variance inflation factors. All right? So it's kind of a it's, it's a little bit of a paradox because if you actually take a point in the uh, uh, a, a regressor vector in you mean the x values in the data set so x equal x1 equals 7 x2 equal to 560 uh, I won't have any trouble in other words if I estimate with this model and then again uh, the variance will not be inflated okay well, that's discussed a little bit in Chapter 10 uh, as well. So there's a section on that in 10.3 if you want to read ahead a little bit. And d methods for dealing with multicollinearity, because this is the basic topic that we're dealing with. So here's what it says on the top of page, okay, bottom of page 330, top of page 331. While the method of least squares will generally produce poor estimates of the individual model parameters, that means the beta 0 hat, the beta 1 hat, the beta 2 hat, will be poor estimates of beta 0, beta 1, beta 2. In other words, there'll be a lot of variability in the betas. When strong multicollinearity is present, variance inflation factors bigger than 10, they suggest. Is a, is a starting point in strong multicollinearity, but you might get 100 or, or 1,000, okay? This does not necessarily imply that the fitted model is a poor predictor. If predictions are confined to regions of the X space where the multicollinearity holds approximately, the fitted model often produces satisfactory predictions. This can occur because the linear combination beta j, xij may be estimated quite well, even though the individual parameters beta j are estimated poorly. All right, that's what's going on. Thus, if the original data lie approximately along the hyperplane defined by the regression equation, then future observations that also lie near this hyperplane can often be precisely predicted despite the inadequate estimates of individual model parameters. <coughs> okay. Uh, I'm sorry, 10.2. Maybe I, I, that wasn't your question. Anyway, we need to, you, you probably didn't make much sense out of that. But there's a point to be made, okay? The, it's only the, uh, the betas themselves that are performing poorly, if you look at it a little bit closer. But that then goes into the problem of extrapolation. Okay. Let's move on to Chapter 4, where we want to talk about model adequacy. So I want to show a famous example um, which is not in the book, <laughs> unfortunately. And, but I put it on the website. Which we can now look at. Okay. 
let's go down here and now we've got something called uh, Anscombe's data. Okay, open it. Then we have to save it and close the window again, unfortunately. Why is it taking so long? Oh, open and save. That's what you're supposed to do. Or right click and save. Let's go back. That's what I want. Let's go back. This is better. Save. What is this? Okay. Just put it in the desktop. All right? Okay, save. That's better because then I don't have to do all that dick messing around. Now click open. Very good. Thank you for that trick. Here it is. Ah. Uh, all messed up. Okay, what there are is there's the cover page and then there's four sheets. If I could only see the actual sheet numbers here, where's how can I get that? Okay. Okay. Study on model checking with the Anscombe's data. Okay, what I have here is four simple linear regression situations. Okay. For each data set, so there's four data sets you can see. I guess the sample sizes are 11 in each case. Four data sets, and for each data set we regress Y, A, on X, A. A goes from 1, 2, 3, and 4. Is everybody clear about that then? I don't know why this is not called Y3. It is, I guess, just that I can't read it very well. Okay. Is everybody following that? And the X's are not, the X's are the same for the, it looks like the X's are the same for the first three models, and then the fourth model it's different. The X's are different. Okay. It turns out in all four cases we retain, retain exactly the same beta hats, the same exact regression sum of squares, the same exact residual sum of squares, the same exact total sum of squares, and the same exact R squares. So the ANOVA table is going to be identical for all four cases. And also the table that goes below the ANOVA table, the, uh, the intercepts and t-statistics and all that stuff. Exactly the same for all four. So, can we make the same conclusions about all four models? The answer, of course, is no. In other words, the numerical, the ANOVA table and the t-statistics and all that stuff doesn't tell us enough. <coughs> All right, it's one window to look through, but it's <laughs> not showing you the whole room. Okay? So, um, and then there's something about probability plus. I hear Excel's normal probability plot, and the regression tool does not plot Z scores or percentiles, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to get to probability plus today, I think. I'm going to have to do it tomorrow. Okay? So, you might re read up a little bit. Of, uh, there's also on the website, I put something about normal probability plots, and I put it at the end of these notes. Okay? So please look at those for tomorrow. My notes for tomorrow will be shorter because I'm, this is a big long set today. Okay? So let's look at X1 and Y1. What I'm doing for what I'm going to do for each one of them, go ahead and make the ANOVA table and it should uh, show exactly what they said it was supposed to show. Uh, 27.51 for the regression sum of squares, 41.27 for the total sum of squares. Um, I'd have to go back and make sure that's what I said. Is that what I said? 41.3, that looks about right. Okay? So all the tables are going to look the same. So these two tables right here are going to look identical for all four models. Let's check that. Um, that look the same? Sure, why not? Sure, why not? Okay. <laughs> Let's make sure it looks exactly the same. Maybe the intercepts, uh, looks like the intercept was 3.009 versus 3.002. I don't know what happened there. Anyway, maybe it's only good to two significant digits. Okay? Um, 3.017 here. Okay. So let's go back here. So what I do is I fit the, the regression line. You've all been doing that. That's automatic with Excel. And then I'm also plotting the residuals. Now, here there's a normal probability plot. And I do have a handout on that that came from the web. I googled normal probability plot. Okay, and I think the third choice came up with um, this web page. Um, which tells you how to construct a normal probability plot. One more? Okay. 
It's got two sides to it. Anyway, there's a, there's a certain thing, and the author gives a shortcut version of normal probability plots. I said I wasn't going to talk about it until tomorrow, but maybe if you read in the book also, he's got a, a few paragraphs on it. Um, there's a shortcut method and kind of the standard method. This sheet is showing you the standard method. What he's really showing you on this web page is he's showing you probability paper. Because on the vertical axis, if you look at the um, vertical axis, I don't know if you can read that at all, probably not. But if you look on the vertical axis, he's got percent. But it's not uniform um, divisions, right? In other words, 5% is not as wide between 90 and 95 as it is between 95 and, and 100. In fact, 100 is not even shown. In fact, 100 is off the scale. 100 is at infinity, okay, on this 100%. So what this is is that these are um, this scaling is corresponds to percentiles. What's the 100th percentile of a standard normal variable? Infinity. Infinity. What's the 99th percentile? Four standard or three. It's something around three standard deviations, not quite that high, okay? And the 95th percentile, 1.96. No, oh, excuse me, 1.645. Yeah, because it's the 5% it's the tail, so it's 1.645. The 97.5 percentile is 1.96. The 50th percentile, of course, is zero, and so on. But you see how the separation between those two numbers is corresponding to these percentiles. So those are percentiles, actually, being graphed. Not percentages, but percentiles of the standard normal distribution. That's the scaling on there, okay? And then what you have here on the horizontal axis is the ordered data. You have to order the data. If it's truly a normal random variable, then with the order, you, you, you take the, the sample and you order it from smallest to largest, and then you plot, um, and you also have to, the, then you have to look at its, then you look at the percent in terms of its rank. If it's the first one, it's the smallest percent. If there are 100 data values, then you get the, basically at the one percent, all right? If the second smallest, you have the 2%. Take that percent and compute a percentile and plot that on the y-axis. Okay? Let's find a percentile, and that's the normal probability plot. Here we're showing weights of Mount's candy bars that apparently looks normal. If it is a normal variable, then the, the, the plot should come out to be a straight line. It looks like you put confidence bands on there, doesn't it? He didn't say so on the web page. And on the back, he's got... Um, well, it looks like those, those years of pennies. I guess how old they are or something. Okay, and I guess that's not normal. <laughs> okay, and it's showing the normal probability of plot. Okay. So that's got a cute web page. It's a real quickie on the normal probability. You need what? Did everybody get one? Oh, okay. Sorry. I didn't put that on the website. Okay, so there's normal probability plot, and I've done that here. I sit, the percentiles, I would also call it a z-score, because you take in a percentage and you convert it to a z-value, right? So these are the z-scores on the vertical axis. You can't read them very well. Um, on there, I can't read them at all. Is there any way to magnify value of the y-axis? Forget it, I can't do that. I just, I'm trying to take this number here. Oh, well, I can't read it. Um, you want to just stretch the chart? It looks like they're big. I can't tell. No, it looks like 1, 1 1.52. That's what it is. 0 0.51, 1, 1 1.5, and 2. Yeah, I can stretch the chart and make sure it looks right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there we are. Okay, <laughs> so those are between minus 2 and 2, which is good. I wanted them to be, okay? Just double-checking. All right, let's put it back where it was. Control-Z, will it work now that I've messed with it? I hit Control-Z twice. Wow, that's some Excel action. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, now then there's the residual plots. Okay, so is this a straight line? Sort of. Sort of. And that's pretty much how residual plots are. Sort of. 
there's actually, if you're really studying uh, to see whether a variable was normal or not, you'd be, you know, you'd be doing some other methods. Okay, and I showed that on the normal probability plot page, which is still on the website, right, and on the back of your notes. You'd actually be looking to see this, some of the curvature in there and so on. All right, so the curvature might come in, but basically we're going to disregard curvature largely in this discussion. Is it kind of along a straight line, or is there like one or two points that are just completely not in the line at all? Okay? And here are the residuals. All right, so let's go to the next one. Let's just sort of look, eyeball these pictures. All right? Now, here is the line fit plot. Okay? Does that look familiar? Probably not. Maybe. Here's the normal probability plot. Is that look okay? Normal probability plot looks still okay. I can't really tell much from it. Okay, at least. But what about the residual plot? The residuals look awful. There's a pattern in the residuals. Okay, the residuals are plotted versus the regressor here in this case. It wouldn't whether you plot against x2 or y hat wouldn't make any difference because y hat is just a linear scaling of x, right? So. Sometimes you plot against the individual regressor. Sometimes you plot against uh, y hat. Okay. In fact, you can get a whole bunch of residual plots, one for each regressor and one for y hat in the multiple regression case. All right. So you plot those, and what you've seen is that there is a pattern, down, up, down, which you can see is consistent with this type of a picture of the straight line fit. So that's not really a linear model, is it, apparently? Okay, it looks, there's some kind of polynomial fit, maybe exact quadratic or something, perhaps. All right, that he messed with the numbers in order to get exactly the same results as the original linear fit. Okay. Okay, but the normal probability plot uh, doesn't look that bad. All right. So again, this is not helping you by itself. The residuals are probably the most important thing. And the normal probability plot in terms of things you look at is way down the list in terms of importance. But usually you'll do some kind of checking with it. Because if it's obviously not normal at all or something very bizarre looking, then that would not be good. Now here's another one where uh, you have, it uh, looks like mostly a straight line except for one point. And then there are those are the residuals and there's the normal probability plot. Okay, what kind of point is that? That observation where it doesn't, it, where an observation, let's see, and I quote from the text or from the notes, where I, which I also quoted from the text. Um, a point that is not typical of the rest of the data. Um, for example, with an unusually large residual. Uh, gives what's called an outlier. In this case, he talks about Y space outliers. Okay, because he's not talking about a point in regressor space that's different from all the other points, like the 30 and 1400 feet, 30 cases of 1400 feet in the delivery time data. That was different than all the other regressor points in X space. But he's talking about in terms of Y, uh, y space, so to speak. All right? Or in terms of the, uh, if you have a large residual, okay, it doesn't fit the rest of the data. So here's a point that's called an outlier point, okay, and that does show up on the normal probability plot, okay. So it looks the normal probability plot looks like a straight line except for that one point, okay. So it looks like just another version of the residual plot in that particular example. In terms of the information that's being given. And finally, we have a bizarre situation where there's only two x values. So you have not too much information in regressor space. And that should, um, so it's not like a linear regression problem at all, so to speak, because you're only taking, you're taking, one, you're taking a sample at one x value. Okay, then you're taking one other x value, one other data point, and you're trying to get a slope out of that, <laughs> okay? It's not clear that what it should be a linear model at all, because the, there might be a curve that just goes up and then down, right? Or down and then up, or, or all kinds of other weird things in between. 
right? So that's not really appropriate design. Well, let's see what you get. The normal probability plot looks fine, though. Because that one regression that's at zero, eh, it, doesn't, it makes maybe an extra point in there here in the middle, but that doesn't really mess things up. Okay. So then when there is one point that's really far away from the others, it tends to have leverage. It'll force the straight line to go through that point. Let's have a lo another look over here. Here's a modified data point. Now it's back to the cover page. Back to the cover page and a modified Anscombe's data. Here I've got two values of x. x Let's see, where is the actual x and y values? Here's x. x is 5, 5, 5, 5, 5. I put 5s and 8s, and then two large ones, one at 19 and one at 40. So I piled up a lot, and then the y's corresponding to the x equals 5 and 8. There's a certain amount of variability, but basically I, I made there be a straight line fit to the data. So if, if I didn't have these two points, there'd be a certain straight line that would go through these, this, this scatter diagram, right? And it would have a higher slope then oh, I'm going to cover with the cursor. I haven't, don't have a very great picture here, but it would, it would, the slope would go like through this, right? It would go up through here. It wouldn't go down here, but these points are forcing the line to go that way. Now, that doesn't cause that much of a residual here, which is the height between the, the point and the line. It doesn't cause great residuals here, okay? But how would I see this stuff happening? Well, so these points have great leverage. They force the line there, because if the line went straight up, look at how giant the residual would be. If the line went through here, and these points determine where the straight line would go, then it'd have a giant residual way out here, right? Well, that's obviously not good, because I'm trying to minimize the squared error. Therefore, this point has a lot of leverage. Now, how would you actually... So it's bending the line, so to speak, back to it, to have a small residual there. Notice you have a really distant point, you might get a zero residual there, and then you might have an even bigger residual here. Okay, like the second away point will have a bigger residual. Okay. I'm not using very good language or grammar there, but okay, I think you got the idea. Now if I actually look at the residual plot, I didn't even bother with the normal probability plot. It was just a bunch of uh, numbers up and down. Okay. So these residuals, if I, if I, you know, like scatter them all over the place, they just look like an amorphous mass in my like a normal random variable. So that's probably not going to actually be a problem. Okay? So it won't look bad on the normal probability plot. Because they're all between, all the residuals. Now, you have to standardize the residuals, right? If you, if you want to put them on a scale minus 2 to 2. So one way to do it would just divide by the square root of ms res, or in other words, divide by sigma hat. Okay, and that puts them roughly between minus two and two in the normal situation. But there are other ways to actually calculate them. Um, so here are the residuals, and there's some standard residuals that Excel computes. Now I was trying to figure out exactly what it's actually doing. There are like three or four different residuals that are in the book, and I couldn't find any of them that Excel is calculating. I spent over an hour trying to figure out. I don't know where to find the reference for their standard residuals. So he's got the residuals. And roughly, it looks like, I think I might have an idea of well, how they're actually computed. But here, sigma hat is about 2. OK? You're roughly dividing by 2 in each of these. So roughly, but it's not exact. And there's some cases where it's different than the factor 2. So for example, 2.4 down to 1.3. That's not dividing by 2. Quite. Or, you know, some of these, it's not exactly that factor. So it's not exactly that formula. And it's not some other formula. So I'm not sure exactly. I forgot what it is. Uh, I thought I'd figure it out once. We're going to talk about something called studentized residuals. What is the definition of a studentized residual? Let's see. I've got AC13. I'm looking at observation number 9 here. That's AC13 is the residual, the actual residual. The standard residual is 0.65. All right, so that's not very remarkable. Residuals between minus 2 and 2, not remarkable at all. Between minus 3 and 3, even. Then you get to 4 and 5 on the standardized scale. Then you're starting to think, okay, that's pretty unusual. Okay? 
standardized residual of nothing, but now there's a studentized residual. What I'm going to have to do here is I divide by the square root of 1 minus H99. What is H99? H99 is here. Okay? That's my, uh, this is my H matrix. Okay? So that's a large HII. It's close to 1. If I, why am I dividing by the square root of 1 minus HII? Because it turns out that the variance, I need a little room here for the board. Oh, we're almost out of time. But I'll get through this, and then we'll come back to this uh, just shortly next time. Let's see. Maybe you can see all of this business. Okay. Here's the H matrix anyway. <coughs> Let's see if I can find an empty spot on the board here. Here's one. Okay. So what's the actual variance of EI? That's the ith residual. What's the variance of EI? It's not uh, sigma squared. The covariance of E is a vector we calculated once upon a time was I minus H sigma squared. The variance of EI is the II entry of the covariance covariance matrix. I diagonal entry of this variance covariance matrix. I better keep in the light, huh? So what does that come out to be? That turns out to be the, what is the II diagonal element of this matrix? It's 1 minus HII. Sigma squared. Okay. So the variance of EI is not sigma squared. It's 1 minus HII sigma squared. So if HII is close to 1, it's much smaller. So if I, norm, if I standardize by dividing by the square root of sigma times this, okay, that's the standard. You have to divide by the square root of the variance to, to normalize so the standard deviation is 1. Remember that? You, <laughs> the variance of x over sigma is 1 over sigma squared times the variance of x. If I'm trying to make the variance equal to 1, then I divide by sigma, not sigma squared. Okay? I'm trying to make the variance 1 to normalize. So I divide by the square root of 1 minus HII. That's what I've done up here. Okay, when I actually looked at this studentized residual, I divided by the square root of 1 minus AC41, which was the diagonal element. So I'm calculating a so-called studentized residual. That is negative 1.7. Ah, well, that's a little closer to 2 or 3. All right. And then there's actually another one called R student, which is a little more complicated formula. What you do is you eliminate the ith observation from the data set. So I take the ninth observation out, recalculate sigma squared. You call that something else. You call that S sub i. There's this deleted notation where you take the ith observation out and then you calculate this. This will be the, the estimate of variance when I take one observation away. Right, it'll be just the, the MS res, the mean square for residual, uh, when I take the ith observation out. Okay? And so what I'll do is use that in there. There's actually a formula for it. Okay? Instead of dividing by sigma hat, I'm going to divide by this one. Okay? Uh, the square root of this one. And there's a little formula for it. There's a bunch of little formulas which are very nice that... Um, he doesn't give you references for. There's, a, there's about half a dozen formulas. Some of them he does in the appendix, and some of them he doesn't. That are cute little formulas that take you like a couple of nights, you know, scratching your head, figuring it out. If they take you a couple of nights, I'm not going to try. I know. Well, <laughs> I mean, anyone it would take a couple of nights, but with the appendices at your at your aid. Okay, so there are some nasty little formulas. But anyway, that comes out about the same. But then there's yet another one which he argues is also a good measure of influence, which is um, to multiply again by the square root of HII over 1 minus HII. 
so that you actually get basically divided by 1 minus HII, not, not just divided by the square root of 1 minus HII. So that blows it up quite a bit, and then you get uh, a measure of influence here of nearly 5, okay, which is on the same, same scale. So that's in a later chapter, 6, I believe. Even though the size of the standardized residuals are not yielding much evidence, it is clear from the residual plot that the simple linear regression model is inadequate because, again, you have this pattern. Okay, down, up, and then just a couple other little things here. Okay, residuals are all down, then they're all up. All right, showing you this kind of pattern. Okay. So, and then we discover this large influence point. So there are some numerical devices, okay, to actually find uh, evidence of influence. All right, so this is just our first foray into the little residual game. We'll play with it more tomorrow, okay? Chapter 4, so we're looking at basically 4, 1 through 4, 3 if you wanted to read in there, okay? Thank you.